Isn't that fun? Good morning. Glad to see everyone as we gather here today. I'm thankful for those who are with us here in the pews and thankful for those who are online worshiping with us. And I'm excited as we gather here today to share in this space. As we do come today, I want to lift up a few announcements to you um, for the next um, for next Sunday on um, the 20th. A few things we needed to, to be reminded of. Uh, just remember that we will gather on the 20th um, at 9.15 to share in a breakfast together. Um, if you have seen in the newsletter, you will have seen a, um, a link that you can click there that will take you to a sign-up sheet where you can sign up for some things to bring. We need some casseroles, some hash brown casseroles, some breakfast casseroles. Um, fruit and things like that. So you can um, check that out. If you need help with that, you can call the office or, or let someone know and we'll be able to, to help you with that. We'll also need some folks to help with setup and cleanup. Um, so if you want to offer your, your gifts in that way, you can let us know that as well. Following our breakfast that morning, we will move into a time of fellowship with our Sunday school classes. Um, kind of think a Sunday school fair, walking around and being able to see what's going on. So this is a great time that if you are not involved in a Sunday school class to um, gather with us and um, see what we're doing and see what's going on and see all the options and ways that you can get plugged in and um, help growing in our faith formation together. Also, um, following, um, or, or not following, but also on the 20th, we will be celebrating in our blessing of the backpacks. So um, all the kids bring your backpacks um, and we can line those up and we'll have a special time of prayer over them in this school year and our educators as we enter into this um, coming school year um, with one another. And so as we come today, um, we come into this space ready to worship, ready to bring ourselves ready to center ourselves as we, oh, Mary, Mary has one more announcement, I forgot. Mary, come on down. <laughs> well, also on the 20th, the choir will be singing back up here in our choir um, loft. And I want to officially invite you. What are you laughing about? officially invite everyone who loves to sing to sing with us. This is a perfect time. We, we're starting up our rehearsals this Wednesday at 6.30 in the choir room. So I invite every one of you. And may I add that it's for um, high schoolers and up. So eighth or ninth grade, if you're a singer and want to join the choir, this is a great time. Please. Thank you. All right, well, as we gather here today, I invite us to center ourselves in this holy space as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. Will you join me in the call to worship on the screen and in your bulletin? Beloved disciples, welcome. As we gather, what are you seeking? Beloved, beloved disciples, if God's presence is all around us, what are you seeking? Beloved disciples, if God is among us, what are you seeking? Beloved disciples, if God is in the face of your neighbor, what are you seeking? As we gather today, may we meet God in our seeking and in our finding. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to join in body and spirit uh, as we sing our hymn of praise. It's number uh, eight number 89 sorry it's at a different place than I thought it was going to be hymn number 89 in the regular hymnal please stand as you're able as you're able Lord, if it is you, we need to hear from you. When we are alone, when we go away, when we have little faith, and when we are battered by the waves, when the wind is against us, when we get in the boat, when we're terrified by our ghosts, when we seek you on the mountain, when we cry out in fear, when we start walking on water and when we begin to sink, when we're far from land, Lord, if it is you, speak to us, calm our fears, calm our storms, strengthen our resolve, remind us that of who you are. Walk to us, call to us, 
save us. Reach out your hand and catch us. Quiet the wind around us. Lord, if it's you, we worship for you, you for truly you are the Son of God. Amen. Let us join in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. I invite you to hear these words found in the 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We are picking up exactly where we left off last week in this 22nd verse. And I invite you to hear these words. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God this time I'll invite our children to make their way forward for children's moments. So you heard from uh, Pastor Travis just a moment ago, he was reading from the Bible, and he talked about Peter and Jesus, and there was a point in time where Peter looked out on the water and he saw Jesus there. Jesus was walking on the water, and he asked Peter to get out and walk to him, and I can imagine Peter was looking right into Jesus' eyes, and he walked toward him, but then the wind blew, and you know what? I can imagine Peter looked down, and he saw the water. And he began to sink. Oh, no. But Jesus reached out and saved him and talked to him about having faith in him. Okay? But you know what? We're going to play a little game. So everybody sit up real straight. Put your feet down on the floor right in front of you. Sit real straight. No, your feet down like that. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, and, and you all can join as well, okay? What we're going to do is play a little game. I want you to look right at me. Okay? Look straight at me. Okay? And I want you to point straight up. Okay? Now I want you to point to the door. Okay, but you gotta look at me. Look at me. And now I want you to point to the windows. 
And now when she points straight up, gosh, that's really good. Could you do it too? Was anybody? Oh, you were doing it. Okay. Joe was doing it. Everybody know that Joe was doing it. Okay. Okay. Now, we're going to do it again, but this time, all I'm going to say is move. So that means you have to really pay attention. You have to look right at me, okay, and do what I'm doing. All right? We're going to start off by pointing up. Move. 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 Very, very good. You all did so well. Okay, we're going to change it again. Now this time, I'm going to step real straight, real, real straight. I want you to bend your head down like this and look down at your feet. Okay? Look down at your feet. Now don't look up at me. Now you guys can do this too if you want. Okay? If you can't see your feet, then just look at whatever. Um, I'm standing up and I can't see my feet. You know, it's, it's, all right, you look straight down at your feet. And now, I'm going, now you're going to have to raise your hand. So raise your hand straight up. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Point to the door. Point to the window. Point straight up. Very, very good. You're so good at this game. All right, now I want you to do it again. I want you to, to sit and look straight at your feet. Straight at your feet. Don't, don't look at me now. And we're going to do it the other way. Now I want you to point straight up. Don't look at me. And when I say move, I want you to point the way I'm pointing. Don't look at me, though. Ready? Move. 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 Okay. Very nice. What happened? What happened that last time? Were you able to uh, point the way I pointed? Eh, it was a little hard. Why was it hard? Because you couldn't see me, right? Right? So when you could hear my voice or when you could look right at me, you followed me just perfectly. But when you were looking down and you weren't hearing my voice, you couldn't follow me. And you just couldn't go the direction I was going. And you know what? That's part of what the, the scripture was trying to teach us. Of course, there are other lessons in it too. But one lesson is that if we keep our eyes upon Jesus, he can guide us and he can direct us. But you know what? We don't always get to look in Jesus' face like Peter did. Sometimes all we can do is be quiet, be still, and hear his voice. And when we hear his voice, he can still direct us, and we have faith that he'll direct us in the right way. When we don't look at him, we have doubts about what we're doing. So let's pray to Jesus now. Will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, help us to have faith so that we may follow your way for us. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to uh, join us with our hymn of preparation called Trust and Obey. It's found in uh, our hymnal number 467. You're able to remain seated. Verses 1 and 2.
Immediately, he made the disciples get into a boat and go on to the other side. Immediately. If you remember where we were last week, Jesus had learned of the death of John the Baptist. And in the wake of that news and that grief, Jesus was in need of withdrawing to himself to be alone. In an attempt to escape the crowds as he is making his way to be alone, the crowds seek him out, as the crowd often does. And not only does the crowd seek him out, but the crowd continues to grow and to swell. We discussed last week that as Jesus saw the size of the crowd that had made their way to him, in his need to have a moment alone, Jesus now takes compassion upon the crowds. He grows concerned And he begins to heal them. He begins to heal the many needs amongst this very large crowd of 5,000 plus people. And as the day grew on and grew long, the disciples grew concerned about their need for food. And Jesus tells them, you remember Jesus said, you all get them something to eat. And so they scrounge up what little food they had, a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, and they take that, and Jesus blesses that, and they give that to the people, and the people eat until they have met their fill, and there was enough for 12 baskets left over. And immediately, he compels the disciples to get into the boat and to head to the other side while he dismisses the crowd. He then retreats up the mountain for this time that he needs to think about everything that has happened, to think about what's going on in his life and in the ministry in which he has given himself to, to which John had given himself to. And while he is up on the mountain having this moment of retreat, Meanwhile, the disciples are in their boat. And while they're in the boat, immediately this storm appears. You know, it isn't hard to imagine what it must have been like for those disciples as they got into the boat, as they were crossing the Sea of Galilee. We need only think for just a moment of the storms that pop up in our own lives. Times in which we have been drenched by the darkness times where we didn't really know where to turn, times where fear of the unknown or of uncertainty has threatened to overtake us. We all know storms come in different ways in our lives, striking us as individuals or as families, as churches, as communities, and the world. It comes in illness, it comes in struggles of relationship, it comes in quarrels and conflicts, and we can all gather around and tell of a story of one time or another in our life where our lives have literally been blown off course, where we felt as if the structures of support that were there to stabilize us had been washed away by the beating waves, where plans, hopes, or dreams were blown off course by the whipping winds around us. And at any point in our life, in those moments, there always seems to be this pesky little question that arises when storms come. And that question is, do we have faith? Do we have the right kind of faith? Do we have enough faith? I want to say today, as we begin talking about faith and what faith is and what faith is not, 
I want to start there with what faith is not. And I want to say that we oftentimes think of faith and doubts and uncertainties, and we, we, we talk about doubt kind of on this opposite end of the spectrum of faith. And I want to say that doubt is not the opposite of faith. Hear me when I say that. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is our certainty in a situation. The opposite of faith is certainty. You see, we can open up scripture and turn to any number of points in, in our lessons that we find, and we can find story after story after story where faith and doubt intersect and bring people to a deeper and more trusting relationship with God. You know, open up to the Old Testament and you can find prophet after prophet after prophet who dealt with their faith, what they were trying to do, what God had tasked them to do, and the doubts of what was how it was going to happen or the doubts of what the people might say or the doubts in their own abilities to carry out what God had laid upon them. Go to the New Testament and you find story after story after story where people have struggled with their faith and with doubt and where it came together and brought them into a deeper trusting relationship. We can look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we can recall the, the conversation that Mary had with the angel when, she told, when the angel told her that she was with child. And we can hear that in the prayer that she lifts up. We can come to today's gospel text and here we have the disciples who are in this boat and suddenly this storm appears and the wind was against them. They were far from land. They were being battered by the waves. And no doubt that the disciples have experienced this type of weather before. After all, many who were on that boat had earned their living fishing in those same waters. And they knew just how quickly that the calm seas could give way to a violent tempest. So that brings us back to asking the question for our own selves and in our own lives, how often do we find ourselves stuck in the storm? At points where we think that we have no control at points where we are out in our own boats and we are enjoying a sail out on the calm waters. And suddenly, immediately, in the next moment, it feels as if we are fighting for our very lives as something comes along and thing after thing tosses us around and batters us. And when we experience these storms in life, the first thing that we usually experience is fear. The disciples on the boat, they were terrified. Not only was the wind whipping around them, not only were the waves crashing, but now there appears to be a figure walking towards them on the water. And from the mouth of this figure that's making its way to them, it says, stop being afraid. Jesus says, it is me. Take heart. How many times has Jesus come to us in our own lives when the storms of life are raging, yet due to our fears, we missed out on seeing God at work right in front of us. How many times have we mistaken who God was out of our fear, not expecting God to be there to begin with? We'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a minute. How often do we have our own presuppositions or our own assumptions in this world and they become those things that prevent us from seeing Jesus for who he is? How often do we cry out in fear when we are faced with the one whom we should ultimately have our hope and our trust placed into? And Jesus says, it's me. Do not be afraid. And then we get to Peter's response. And, and Peter's response is a very Peter response, if you will. 
It is one mixed with hope and gumption. It is one that's also mixed with a little healthy dose of uncertainty. If it's really you, Jesus, then tell me to come out into the water. If it's really you, Jesus, let me know. And that makes me think, how often do we echo those words of Peter? If it's really you, tell me what to do, Lord. If it's really you, make me do something that I cannot do on my own. In other words, we say, if it's really you, God, prove to me that it is you. And Jesus calmly obliges Peter and says, okay, then come on out. Yet even after Jesus beckons Peter to step foot out of the boat and onto the water, fear once again makes itself known as the winds begin to whip around. As Peter begins to notice the strength of the storm, fear becomes just as much an enemy of faith as the uncertainty that Peter might have had. Friends, anymore, I am beginning to believe that fear is much more of a danger to our faith than doubt or uncertainty or any of those things ever possibly could be. Because all too often in our society, what we find is that it is fear that leads everything, that pushes so much upon us. It is fear that sparks anger. It is anger that leads, gives way into violence. It is disagreement that becomes division. It is division that becomes polarization. And then we find that each group, whether or not whatever side they lie upon, then begins to perceive the other as a threat to the peace and health of the overall. But there is something more. There is something deeper than clashing ideologies at work in our society, friends. Something that continues to, to, to polarize and divide people. It's fear of giving up power or giving up control. Because what we know is that in the midst of our brokenness, we have been conditioned to believe that having a hand over someone, controlling someone, using our influence, exercising power over each other is the only way that we can move forward. And it's that kind of thinking that leads to this oppression. And, and I'm pretty sure that Jesus was pretty clear that oppressing one another, that pushing our agendas on one another does not fit into God's plan for us. That instead of exercising power over another, Jesus comes along and he demonstrates another way, a power under, as we support one another in love. As we support one another, as we, as we give of ourselves. Now that brings us back to Peter and Jesus who were out there standing dark on that dark water. As the waters around them are being churned up, as the winds are blowing against them. And Jesus' response to Peter, he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now keep in mind that little faith might not be the reprimand from Jesus to Peter that we want to think that it is. Because Jesus might be reminding Peter that he does, in fact, have enough faith, even though his faith may be small. Because after all, I believe I recall reading at some point where Jesus said that if we had but the faith the size of a mustard seed, that we could say to that mountain, get up and be planted in the sea, and it would do so. But when Jesus says, why do you doubt? Maybe what he's asking is, why did you doubt that it wouldn't be me? Weren't you expecting me. I mean, think about it for just a moment. Who else in the world would be coming out to the disciples in the midst of this boat and the wee hours of the night walking across the water? Why assume to begin with that this figure making their way in the distance was a ghost? 
Why did Peter doubt for a moment that the only possible person that it could have been walking on water in the midst of the storm would have been none other than Jesus himself? Now, it's also worth pointing out here that the word that is used for doubt in Matthew 14, it's only used twice in the New Testament here and and another time in Matthew 28. And in that instance, in Matthew 28, it is following Jesus' resurrection just prior to Jesus giving the Great Commission. And in that story, what's going on is we are told that there were those, as Jesus was ministering, that there were those who worshipped him, but some doubted. Now this word, it doesn't refer to unbelieving or uncertainty because it could really be translated as as wavered. Because we're going to go back and we're going to remember what is it that is the opposite of faith. It isn't doubt, it is certainty. So maybe, just maybe, wavering can indeed be an act of deep faith. And here's why. Because when we waver... We admit our own uncertainty. In our wavering, we show humility. In our humility, we can then begin to learn and depend upon God alone, not in ourselves, not in what I can do or what you can do or any of us together could ever do. When we waver, we have to admit that we don't have all the answers, we don't know everything. And we become receptive to the truth and those things that lie beyond our own understanding. How can a human possibly walk on water? We can't explain it. We have to learn to trust in something or someone beyond ourselves in order that we might begin to be able to grasp the ungraspable. And it is there that we begin to grow. We grow in our faith. We grow in our understanding of who God is and what God can do. When Jesus asks Peter, why did you doubt? I don't think that that was a rhetorical question. I think Jesus really wants to know what it is that causes us to waver to have faith, to open up and answer the question honestly as Jesus reaches out his hand and lifts us up. Because here's the thing, Peter was not the only one in the boat who was afraid. They were all afraid. While the other disciples may have stayed in the boat where they belonged, they struggled against that same opposing winds that blew against them. Fear in the face of opposition, certainty in the face of mystery. These are the things that become enemies of our faith. So friends, I need you to think about this today. I need you to ask this crucial question that just as Jesus wanted to know why did you doubt, Why weren't you expecting me? I need you to ask yourself this. Are you expecting Jesus to show up here today? Are you expecting Jesus to show up in the midst of this church or in the midst of this community around us? Do we believe that he knows about us and cares about us and is here for us? Because you see, if we are going to continue along in this journey in God's spirit, we will have to find ways to keep expecting God to be there. Because the question is not, is Jesus with us? The answer to that is obvious, yes question is, are we expecting him? Are our eyes open to his presence among us? 
And if we're not, then we need to build a habit of having an expectation of seeing Jesus all around us. Because seeing Jesus is not just a casual happenstance, it is a cultivated habit. It is something we work at. So maybe today and maybe every day this week and going forward, we begin to ask ourselves, maybe when we lay down at night, we begin by asking ourselves, where did I see Jesus today? How have I seen Jesus at work in my life or in the community around me or in the lives of those who I love? And maybe as we begin to do that, as we begin to cultivate the habits, we begin to grow in our expectations of seeing Jesus and knowing that Jesus is all around. So friends, we there have an opportunity to step out in our faith, to step out of our boat of ordinariness and onto the waters, fully expecting Jesus to be there regardless of the situation or the storm or the waves, or the winds. So might we be ready to leave the security of what we know and step out into our faith. For we pray these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our response to the spoken word is verse 4 of Trust and Obey, number 467. gather here today we come and we join together to pray with and for one another and we lift up those today who are in our bulletin and our prayer list and those needs that we have heard and made known among us today as we come this day let us bow in the presence of God Lord as we gather here today May you forgive our weakness and our lack of trust in you. For we are like the disciples who, in the midst of the fears and the storm, we could only tremble and wonder about the threatening events around us. Even when Jesus called out to his disciples, they shook with fear. But Jesus offered words of encouragement. We see today, we are reminded of the impulse to which Peter had as he asked to be bid out of that boat. And as Jesus complied and Peter stepped over the edge onto the waves, fear exclaimed him once again as he began to sink. Lord, so many of us can identify with that moment of letting go of our faith and clutching onto our fears. So God, today, may you help us place trust in you and your call to us. May you guide us, may you lift us to safety. For that is the promise that you have given to us, and Lord, we believe in it. So Lord, as we enter into this week around us, when our faith slips, might you scoop us up and bring us peace giving us strong hearts and willing spirits that we may be your disciples. And God, today as we gather, as we hear these concerns, 
Lord, I pray that you be at work within us, within our lives, in us, and among us. For God, we know that there are so many things looming on our horizons that oftentimes our focus is placed upon those. So Lord, may you be with us and remind us to place our focus on Jesus who calls us to trust in his mercy and in his care. Lord, might you keep the need of others in our heart and mind, needs of healing, needs for comfort, need for friendship. And may we reach out to them and offer our gifts of service in your name. God, love us and guide us. And today as we come, Lord, we gather together our voices and the prayer in which your Son, our Lord and Savior, taught to his disciples as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the richness of God's mercy that is poured out over us every moment of our lives, even when we least expect it, today as our ushers prepare to come forward, let us prepare to give from our hearts our tithes and our offerings for the gratitude of what God has done for us and among us so that we may become better servants of the gospel. Give us a new vision, give us new sight. 
first offering you ask for is giving of ourselves, loving you and others boldly, and refusing to let our fear of the storms around us keep us from taking risks. Forgive us for times when you have called us to leave our places of comfort and we've ignored your call. Forgive us when our giving has not grown beyond our safety zone, but you blessed our gifts and us anyway. For those times when we dared to put our foot outside the boat and sank up to our knees, Thank you for not taking your hand away. For all this, we give thanks in the holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The fourth hymn is uh, God of Grace and God of Glory, number 577 in the hymnal. you have been embraced by the love of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and blessed by Jesus that you may go into this world around you to offer healing and hope. So let us dare to step out of the boat and into the midst of the storm as we know and expect Jesus to be there. Go in his goodness this day. 